So today we're going to talk about something pretty serious. Um, as you can see from the title, this video is called The Dark Side of Homeschooling, and I have notes. Um, is this sensational? Is this a lot? Yeah. Is it needed? Yeah. So homeschooling has exploded um, since 2020. If it wasn't growing at breakneck speed before, it certainly is now. And what's happening now is we're seeing um, a lot of ethnic minorities like myself join the ranks of the homeschoolers. So when I started homeschooling 20 years ago, um, I was one of few. And um, our demographics are growing quickly. And so I think it's important to address where homeschooling can go bad now so that people are aware of these things and can make moves to prevent that from happening. Okay. Um, some of the reasons homeschooling has grown the way it has grown is because the technology allows it. Um, we've made great strides in technology, um, digital instruction, um, group communication online, collaboration, all kinds of neat tools. Uh, we as people have grown wary and suspicious of traditional education, especially when we're seeing the numbers um, based on how our children are punished at greater rates in traditional school and the outcome on the other end doesn't exactly favor um, black kids and other ethnic minorities doing well. I'm sure that in countries outside the United States that they also have their set of homeschooling laws. So when you have decided that you're going to homeschool or when you first start getting curious about homeschooling, the thing you need to do is research the laws for your state or locality where you are to find out what you as a homeschooling parent are responsible for. In the United States, like I said, there's like 50 states and um, each one has its own rules. But all of those rules can kind of get chunked up into four categories um, because many states copy the other states or they're at least similar to the other states. And so um, there's what we call um, no notice required, low regulation. That means you wake up one morning, you decide you're going to homeschool, you just start homeschooling, you don't take kids back to school. When the truancy officer calls you, you go, we're homeschooling, leave us alone. Um, and you just go on and homeschool to the best of your ability. Um, based on what the laws in your state say, which usually say, you know, give them an education commensurate with what they would get in schools. Um, states that are no notice, low regulation are New Jersey, Connecticut, Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, and Idaho. I'm sorry, it's allergy season. <laughs> So those are the no notice required low regulation states. Um, I know people who live in New York um, who have just gone ahead and moved to New Jersey or Connecticut because it was close enough to homeschool with no regulation. Because we'll get to that in a minute, but New York is very high regulation. Um, and then we have low regulation, just low regulation, um, meaning notice is required, but there's low regulation. And most of the states fall into this category. The states are California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, where I am, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Wisconsin, Maryland, and Delaware. These states require that you send notice each year, and it's usually a form online that you fill out, and that you test, my state requires that you test your child, give your child a nationally normed standardized test every three years. So it's usually like, if you're going to start homeschooling from the beginning, you give a test like in third grade and then sixth grade. And then in ninth grade, you can just go ahead and give them the PSAT. And then you want to keep testing with the SAT to prepare them for college at that point. But basically the point of those tests is so you can find out if your child has any holes um, and, and fill them, you know, fix whatever it is your child does not know at that point in time. Some homeschoolers go ahead and test every year. Some test less, but you really should be testing at least every three years. There are states with moderate regulations. Um, they require the notice of intent, um, record keeping, and then whatever those state standards say. Um, and some require annual progress reports. Those moderate regulation states are Washington, Oregon, North Dakota, Minnesota, West Virginia, 
Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and Hawaii. Finally, mm -hmm. there are states that are considered high regulation. So what does high regulation mean? Well, these are the states with a lot of government oversight. Um, and that may include submitting, not only giving a notice of intent, but kind of getting permission. Like you give a notice of intent and they say, okay, you can homeschool. And you have to um, submit your homeschool plan each year that they approve. And they may send it back a few times. Um, and then at the end of the year, they, want, they will want to review um, the work you have done to make sure that you have done what you said you were going to do and that you have um, kind of kept up what the school standards are in that state. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. These are the hardest um, states to homeschool in. Um, when we were first thinking about homeschooling, we did live in New York, and I spoke to a lot of New Yorkers. It's not that bad. Um, you just have to do paperwork twice a year. Um, and um, the way I homeschooled here in Georgia, I could have done that paperwork and everything would have gone well. So it's just a matter of being more stringent and more diligent about paperwork. Okay, so that's what um, the rules, the basic general rules are for homeschooling in the U.S. Um, that's what the governmental oversight looks like. Um, those four states, um, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, have the most oversight. Um, Jersey, Connecticut, Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Idaho have the least oversight. Um, but cracks happen in every single state. I've seen bad situations happen in high regulation states and bad situations happen in low regulation states because some people are just good at doing the paperwork and then not doing what it says on the paperwork. So I don't know that high government oversight, um, with the exception of the standardized testing, um, does especially well, but I've seen people skip states to get out of that also. So there's that. So like I said before, um, in my research, everything was pointing toward the lack of oversight being the cause for educational neglect or abuse. And I disagree. I believe that a lack of oversight can cause even the best parents to maybe get too relaxed and comfortable um, with paperwork and follow through over time, um, causing them to fall behind and get burned out. Still, government oversight is not necessary for accountability. Homeschool groups can supply this um, kind of support and encouragement. Now, um, I have access to homeschoolers in two different ways. First, I am the director of homeschool program. Second, I am the parent of um, kids in their late 20s who are homeschooled. And so I have access to dozens of young 20, I say 26 to 32 year olds who are homeschooled, um, who are real honest and who have been real honest with me about their homeschool journeys for good and for bad. And so I know what the cracks in homeschooling looks like. And then there's Reddit. And I've read that. If you really want to know what the worst parts of homeschool are, re go ahead and read the Reddit stories, like for real. So from what I have seen, the biggest problem that starts off small and then snowballs, and this happens in the best of families with the best of parents, is fear of math. Fear of math to the point that students fall years behind. Um, this can be fixed. Um, what you have to do is build a daily schedule um, and make math the first thing that's done in the morning. For my kids, it was one child would do piano, then math, and the other child would do math, then piano, and I'd have them switch days. Um, but that's how our morning started. You know, you get up, you do it, you exercise that muscle, you get out of the way. Um, nothing is going to cure fear of math like, a, like daily exposure to math. Um, but you know, some kids are just really good at pitching a real good fit when you don't want to do something. And it does wear the parent down, but you can't. You can't let them wear you down around that subject. Other subjects you can catch up on, math, if you get behind, it becomes a slog. Okay, and the other problem I have seen, and, and this is where I've seen emotional problems start to crack, um, and maybe even a little abusive issues start to crack is when there's too much focus on chores. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> too much focus on chores. 
and keeping a perfect how and putting that in front of the child's education. Um, if you have kids home all day, your house is going to be messy. Um, the way to make your house less messy is to have less crap in your house. Um, not to make your children clean for hours at a time. So if your kids being home because of the messy house, then um, conmari that house, you know, like purge, get rid of some things. That's going to help you have a cleaner house better than your children spending an onion amount of time cleaning when they should be reading, writing and doing math. Um, and the only th I, like I feel like a half hour of day chores for kids is plenty. Um, unless they have a pet and then that extends like to an hour because they've asked for that pet, right? Um, but I have seen kids, even those who love to clean, um, fall behind in academics because um, household chores have taken precedence. And so there are some kids who love to clean and hate doing schoolwork and they all volunteer to just keep cleaning. And so you have to be like, you have to stop cleaning now and you have to go sit down and do your schoolwork. Um, and this is, goes especially for large families. <sighs> Over the decades, because I've been at this for decades at this point, I've seen the message boards. Um, veteran homeschoolers like me, veteran means you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, wore it out, right? Um, say, well, you know, when your older kids reach a certain age and they can pitch in and that makes your job easier, don't do that. Don't do it. Um, I've seen older children's education sacrificed, and I'm reading my notes to make sure I don't forget anything, sacrificed for uh, care and feeding of the younger children. If you want a quiver full of kids, those are your kids. Those are not your children's kids. Get a nanny. Get a housekeeper. Get, get a helper. Get a relative. But don't make a 15-year-old responsible for a four-year-old when that 15-year-old really should be um, working on the hardest part of their school education at that point so that they can matriculate into college or that they can intern into a job or a business. Like, please don't make your teenagers parents of your younger children. That is abusive to the kids. I know this is going to make people mad, but your big kids should be doing school too. They shouldn't be taking care of a little kid. Now, there are times when my kids are only two years apart and my son at one point decided that, you know, his sister's speech impediment, you know, people had been talking about her speech impediment and he decided he was going to fix it. And he took her by the hand and sat her on the stairs every day right after lunch and just corrected her for 20 minutes you know he'd just have her talk and when she said something because it was a vowel problem and her lips were big for her little face at that point um but when she pronounced something wrong he would pronounce it more crisply um and so like a little bit of teamwork is fine but a, a teenager being responsible for their younger siblings care and or education takes away from theirs because once you're if you're college bound you should be spending six hours a day at least four days a week um working on your homeschooling and and doing extracurriculars and your child's high school journey should not suffer for the sake of you having a large family and and these are cases where i've seen the most cracks so The worst kind of um, red flags I have seen um, happen in a way that it's hard to really even know what's going on, and it's kind of impossible to make any suggestions, offer help, or make any accusations. But um, there are a lot of parents, because it happens a lot, who will... Um, beginning of every year and maybe mid-year, maybe three or four times a year, um, put their kid into a new homeschool co-op, a new homeschool group, you know, for group classes. And then two, three, four weeks down, yank them. Yank them. I have seen some kids go, oh, I finally have friends. And then the next week they're gone. And the parent's like, oh, well, it didn't work for us. Or mm, my child gets sick a lot. Or, um, well, my child wasn't unhappy. Or I didn't like that one math lesson, but um, I think I saw three kids come through this year that were there for a whole half minute. And even then they weren't there regularly, like the parent wasn't 
dropping them off according to schedule and when classes are only like one day a week, you know, missing two weeks. Like, what is that? You know, then eventually they yank them. Um, Not letting homeschool kids make connections is a problem. And that does raise a red flag. That makes one wonder what is going on at home. And then you find out from, because homeschool community in your county is going to be small. I know mine is. You find out from other people, oh, they did that in two other programs last year. They brought their kids in and then yanked them in 30 days. Problematic. Problematic. The children aren't being allowed to socialize. The children aren't being allowed to make attachments. This is the kind of homeschooler that I worry about the most because the bad things happen in isolation. So, isolation is just as bad for the parent as it is for the child. Um, it leads to parental burnout. Okay. Um, as an introvert, I had to really go out of my way when I was in my 30s and 40s because, look, I was real happy to be at home with my kids. And I had to really go out of my way to make connections in the homeschool community, um, make friends, make lunch dates, um, have my kids in the co-op once a week and then go meet with just regular adults on those days. Um, I really had to bend over backwards to not isolate because that is my propensity. Um, but it's just so important for you to have homeschool friends, um, to plan group activities with other homeschoolers. Um, it's just so easy to become depressed and agoraphobic. Um, I'm one of those people who have lost a lot of family members. And I know after one in particular, I just didn't want to get out of bed for a year. And understandably so, right? But is that any good for the children? It's not. You can't hold up your child's education with your grief and depression. Ooh, that sounded flippant and horrible. But like, I'm talking from my own personal perspective, from my own experiences. And I knew that I couldn't do that to my kids. So as a major introvert, um, what I did was, you know, made sure they had their once a week or twice a week co-op, whatever was going on at that time in our lives. And then on those days, I started having regular lunch dates with friends and or doing my little side business, um, which was um, when my kids were small, it was buying things at discounters and then selling them on eBay. And then when they were older, ooh, when they were older, it got hard because I was I was vlogging and vlogging for money. And so I would make it real easy to just go home and dig into my work. But on those days, I made sure that I was out visiting with other adults. You know, even if it meant going and hanging out with my mother-in-law and doing things for her, I wasn't isolating no matter how much I wanted to. Because um, that lack of adult interaction can cause depression. Um, and that depression will cause you to isolate yourself and your kids. And that is a giant problem for homeschooled kids. At the end of the day, homeschooling is hard. And if your child fails to thrive, no one can be blamed for their failure except you. Everyone's going to take, you know, a little, I, I helped with their success. But failure, that's completely on the homeschooling parent. So mind your P's and Q's. Like, like be aware of your propensities and fight them. Like, I had to fight um, depression due to family death. Like, I really had to fight it. Um, it would have been real easy to just fold it in and not do co-ops and just hang out at home with my kids, but they would have failed to thrive um, in many ways, especially socially, um, had I done that. They were fine academically um, because we did most of the academics at home and I did a good job, but they wouldn't have had their arts programs. They wouldn't have had fencing. They wouldn't have had track. You know, um, they wouldn't have made connections. They wouldn't have made lifelong friends that they still had um, had we not done that. Okay. Here's where it gets weird. All right. So potential for religious and ideological indoctrination. Um, homeschoolers tend to be a real conservative bunch. Um, and I've had my real conservative moments, um, but I tend to swing back to center often. Um, 
homeschooling can be used to isolate your children from different ideological perspectives, from different political perspectives, from different religious perspectives, from different ethnic perspectives. Um, and it works to the detriment of the child. Like it's gonna backfire eventually. Like eventually your kids are gonna reach adulthood and look back and go, my parents did me wrong. They isolated me and now I'm out here in the world and I'm feeling like a complete neophyte. I don't know what's happening. Um, age appropriately, you have to let your children understand what's going on in the world around them. Even if it, even if you do teach them and say, but this is what we believe. Like I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. You tell your children what you believe. You tell your child how you deal with things that you don't believe in, but you don't make your children scared of people who are different because that's not going to make for a healthy adult. And and that is a form of abuse of homeschool. Um, I did a video someone's back on shiny, happy people. Um, and so I'm not going to go all too far into this, but it talks about, you know, this like homeschool, like cultish way of doing that um got that the Duggars were involved in, the whole queer reform movement is involved in. And we see how, you know, 15 years later, all of that is spiraling in a really weird way. And like we don't want our kids in 15 years to look back at us and say, my parents were homeschooling based on someone else's ideology and um I suffered for it. So beware of groupthink. Beware of groupthink. Um, beware of any organization that lays out a blueprint on how you should raise your kids. I remember in the early days of homeschooling, I went to a homeschool convention and, you know, there was the big, you know, auditorium with all the vendors and all the curriculums. And you go and you talk to each person and you get a little preview of what each curriculum was like and you, you know, you get a feel for it and, you know, you can make some informed decisions that way. But they were also on the other side of the arena, these um, classrooms. And they were like, how to parent, how to do this, how to do that, like how to be a parent, like how to get discipline in your homeschool, like stuff like that. And I was like, I think I know how to parent. And I really don't want anyone telling me how to parent. Now, my husband and I had strong convictions on how we were going to parent our children from even before we got pregnant the first time we knew where we were going to be on the gentle parent side, not the kind of gentle parent that people are talking about right now. We just didn't believe in yelling at kids excessively. Um, and we believe that, you know, whatever propensities your children are born with, you nurture that. You don't try to tamp them down and have to build them back up later. Um, but but I, any organizations that's telling you, that's giving you a rule book on how to raise your kids, on how to spank your kids and stuff like that is problematic. Like even in my church, I had men come to my husband and say, because my husband traveled a lot, well, you need to find a way to take your son with you to travel because your son's going to become like, like your wife. My son did not become like me at all. Um, he's, he's very paternal <laughs> of me, which is weird. Um, but you know, like that was just people imposing their own personal ideology on how you should parent. And I don't think any parent should accept that. Um, each child is different and each child requires a different approach. And anyone who preaches otherwise is guilty of severe overreach at, at best. At worst, it's cultish behavior. So I said what I said. I said all those things. <laughs> um, we're in an exciting place in homeschooling. Um, we're seeing all demographics of people um, homeschooling. And while new families are flooding in, I just want you to be aware of, it can go right. It can go right and it can be genius and unique and individual in so many ways, but it can also become isolating for the parent. It can be become isolating for the child. Um, you can get too comfortable and get a little too relaxed with paperwork and with planning. And those are areas where, um, on the end, your homeschooling may not be as successful as you had wanted it to be. Now, the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray. Um, and so will all the best plans you had for your children when they were seven um, come to fruition at 17? Nope. Because you have no way of 
anticipating who those kids are going to be. But the goal is for you to help your child become their best self. So it would behoove you to follow the rules of your locality. Um, do the testing. Do more than the amount of testing required. Um, look into ways of exposing them to um, other homeschoolers, exposing them to advanced um, opportunities because homeschoolers will advance quickly. Um, putting them in group situations that are vetted by you. Um, letting them finish what they start because putting them in something and pulling them out is, is a little damaging to their psyche unless they're in this place where it feels damaging, right? So plan, um, interact, engage, and review every year. Um, please ask questions. Um, check out my video, Shiny Happy People, on this channel. Um, I have a series on my business channel, Cheese Best Publishing, um, that is to 20-something-year-olds who are done homeschooling, talking about the experience. If you really want to know what it looks like on the other end, go check that out. I will put in a link. And that's it. Until next time.